A doctor prescribed cannabis to an ex, to a former police officer. He didn't know that he was prescribed. His kid took care of it with a doctor, and and I was sent there to educate him with his first batch of cannabis as a licensed instructor. And I'm getting to the house. I'm knocking on the door, which is kind of a normal thing to do. And the guy opens a small like gap in the door, and he goes like, "Hi, who are you?" And I'm like. Hi, my name is Gil. I came here to instruct you about your cannabis. I brought your cannabis with me. And the next thing that happens is the door opens wide and I end up with a gun pointed here to my forehead. You are under arrest. Now, I will share that at that specific moment, I kind of, may have lost uh, um, control over my uh, bladder and uh, kind of peed myself. And, <laughs> and then I apologized and asked him for, for his uh, uh, permission to give him the documents that I carried with me, because these are yours, these are not mine. This is your cannabis prescription, and this is your cannabis license. Here is your cannabis that I'm just really want, but please, I came all the way from Herzliya. Yeah, this is my instructor's license from the Ministry of Health. I made a small mess. Did I clean up and have a glass of water? And like, I'm still at gunpoint. I just, I'm, I'm trying to recover. And this guy goes like, I'm a police officer. And I'm like, well, you look sick, but please, can I? And, and he said, yes, and he was furious, and he's looking at the documents, and then he took the gun away. And a few minutes later, I'm sitting down after I cleaned myself up, some, somewhat, let's say, and, uh, and took a glass of water, and I'm sitting in his kitchen barrel, and, and he called his doctor his GP, because his general physician obviously was behind this. And he called him, and the next thing that, that goes on the line is a screaming conversation of, drugs, you gave me drugs? I'm going to arrest you for being a drug, uh, a drug trafficker. Don't you know I was the head of the Israeli anti-drug agency? Ah, and he hung up his dog. And then now I'm, I'm understanding that the situation is not yet diffused. I'm in the man's kitchen. He still has the gun. And he's pissed off. And I'm trying to explain to him, like, sir, I think that you're misunderstanding the situation, but can I ask you a question? Yes. What kind of medicine are you on right now? And then he took out the list. Now, this guy was on oxycode, oxycontin, fentanyl, and this is a mix, and actic. Now, I'm looking at him, and I'm saying, sir, are you sure you were the head of the, the drug agency? He's like, yes. In this case, can you call your friends and ask them what drug addicts are looking for when they're, you know, breaking into pharmacies as, you know, the, the best, strongest drugs, the narcotics, the ones that replace their heroin? Then he called his friends at the precinct. And they gave him the list of the top four drugs that are wanted by drug addicts. And he's like, I'm on all four of these. And then he called his doctor again. And he screamed at him even further, saying, You got me addicted to drugs? You bastard, I'll hunt you. And he hung up the phone. And then he's looking straight at me in my face. Okay, bring me this cannabis thing. I want to learn. <laughs> so <laughs> that's fucking awesome. So coming to patient education, their own perspective and perception about life 
can be a whole different thing that you need to overcome yourselves. <clears throat> but seriously, and, I, and now this is just one of the anecdotes. I, this was the worst one, the worst ever patient education beginning I got. But when he sent me home, he gave me a hug and he thanked me for coming and helping him because now, and he was like, you could see that he's head on and he's headstrong and he's committed to quitting slowly but firmly with the doctor's advice and collaboration because the doctor called to apologize and, and tried to explain that the cannabis is going to help him reduce these medicines over time. And so he was committed to quitting all of these narcotics because in his mindset, until that patient, that moment this morning, he was a pain patient. And cannabis was a drug. The shift he had in his mind this morning was that cannabis is his pain medicine. But right now, he's a drug addict that needs to recover. And this shift in perception is so great. And this is something that we can help people do and we can get into people's minds and experiences through act. But do you think uh, his thought, quick change in perspective is because he had that uh, experience from birth that he already had seen what heroin or opiates do to people and he has probably also seen <laughs> drug addicts on cannabis so i do i do believe and i do believe also that the reason that he was opposing cannabis so much was because of the gateway drug theory that he was also promoting and advocating for as a police officer saying uh, everybody that i've arrested that got to be arrested as a drug addict started with cannabis or almost everybody and this in his mind kept the perception of cannabis is a gateway drug it's even though it's been refuted in, in various researches and whatnot it doesn't change the the mindset of people and when you come from within the system, and this is your belief set, the only thing that actually changes it was, at least for him, was the personal experience of, oh shit, I'm a drug addict. And I didn't, yeah, this, this is much lesser than what I'm actually doing now. Should I reduce the harm from becoming, from being a drug addict de facto? to being a cannabis addict or cannabis consumer, even a cannabis addict in his mind, is it better or worse than staying a heroin addict in his mind? Mm -hmm. It's a different thing. It's not about whether I'll use drugs now. It's I am a drug user. What's the lesser evil for him? His space where he was on that day. But it's got me to, to the real realization that a lot more people are suffering. Like I extrapolate from these personal experiences. And even though I've had 5,000 of these personal experiences of, of educating patients and the families firsthand, I can extra ex probably extrapolate much further because of it. But each individual case teaches you about the mindset of the general public. And, and even though everybody's very unique and individual, they come from the same education framework and, and history and mindsets as a similar group. And the more we can understand these subgroups and what makes them tick and what kind of misconceptions they live in, the better and easier it is to shed light on truth. Because I didn't tell him that cannabis isn't a drug. No, I said it is. I didn't tell him that cannabis is not something that he will need to learn to interact with and that he will suffer side effects. Because I did say all of those things. I even explained exactly the side effects, including the psychoactivity side effects. 
that he might not like and how to diminish them and to reduce the, these side effects and to manage them over time. And I explained that it's not a matter of instantaneous thing like when you're taking a pill because the dose differs and your body's reaction to it differs. And because it's operating on a balancing system in your body, it might take time for the whole wave to kind of reduce until it's kind of almost, it will never be a flat line now. Let's remember, flat line is dead. It's just that the peaks will be lower and the lows will be higher. That's where we're aiming for. We still want you to be looking like your life. Okay? Now, once this is kind of the mindset that we get them into, <clears throat> it promotes, and like with him, it promotes the realization, first of all, that we're authentic, that we're not advocates for drugs, but we're trying to help people recover from the worst experience of their lives, of living the, the illness. It's not being ill that's the worst part. It's the mindset of living as a sick person. As it's, it's the disabled mind versus the disabled body. And once we get these people to not feel because they have a choice, we have done our part in the world. And we, you know, we've shared our gift and from now on it's on them. But it's on us to, to keep sharing this and to keep the things real, to not get people to think of the big miracles and the big things that might happen but actually the small miracles of sleeping two hours a night after not being able to sleep two hours straight but waking up every 40 minutes is a huge miracle for a patient sleeping three hours a night for the same patient is already additional 50 percent on the original miracle now once we account for the small miracles of you know what, it's not that I don't suffer pain, but I can reduce my pain level to, to a level that I can actually sit down on the ground and play with my granddaughter. Isn't this a miracle for a grandfather? 